But even though I say coming up with an idea is quite easy, there is that next challenge of, as I said before, coming up with too many ideas and knowing which ones to work on and spend plenty of time on. But then the other challenge is, at face value, an idea might seem superb. Um, but then when you start to scratch below the surface and start to think about some of the difficult stuff like um, how do I make money out of this and does anybody want it, you might suddenly quickly find that actually that idea wasn't brilliant um, and then you've got to get excited about the next thing. Um, now, an interesting thing that I did with a team of individuals, um, which, which I think is really important when you start your innovation journey, is about breaking your mental models. So um, I had a room full of um, supply chain directors, funny enough, and I asked them, gave them a piece of paper, gave them some paper clips, and I said, look guys, can you, can you, I'm gonna give you 15 minutes, you're all gonna compete against each other, I want you to make a paper airplane. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand on one side of the room, and we're going to throw it, and whoever <coughs> goes the furthest wins this competition. And it was amazing. For five minutes, I heard people saying, oh, there's a trick here, there's a trick here. What's the trick, what's the trick? And then for the next five minutes, they all made your bog standard paper airplane. And then for five minutes afterwards, they were then playing around with paper clips to try and make it a little bit heavier so that it was all more aerodynamic so it could go a little bit further. And you, know, you, had, you had people who were trained as engineers in the room, they were doing all sorts of fancy stuff. And, and it, it looked great. And then we stood on the other side of the room, and invariably there's always one person who understands what, what I'm trying to achieve in this class, um, but, but leaves it to the last minute. And they all stood in the room, and one guy literally took, took a few paper clips, put it in the middle of the piece of paper, scrumpled it up, and then locked it across the room. And of course, it went, it went the furthest. And, and that's what's, what's interesting is, he, he didn't, I mean, it was a bit about the language that I was using, but he didn't automatically jump to, it has to look like an airplane, it has to be <coughs> safe, it has to be aerodynamic, it has to be all these things. He, you know, my specification was very simple. All I cared about was how far it goes across the room. You're not putting passengers in there, you're not putting cargo in there. You know, just think about things differently and just try and do something different. And actually, sometimes with ideas, you have to move from the sublime to the ridiculous and then, and don't think about how you're going to actually do it. Just think about you know what it is that's going to meet you, your customers' needs or find new customer needs, and then start to work backwards to okay, what is more realistic? What can I actually do? And you can still find a middle ground in there that could be a really exciting idea. Um, but now, now that you've broken people's mental models, you still need to have a way of getting people to think outside of the day-to-day -day and, and, and come up with something different. Because at the end of the day, you've all got businesses, and those businesses have a set of capability. In some cases, you've got a product. In some cases, you've got a service. And, and to be honest with you, if, if you're I don't know, making widgets or, or doing business process outsourcing, and someone comes up to you and says, no, let's actually stop doing all of that, because I've got a great need around sending a man to the moon, you know, you're going to sit there and say, well, that's great. and that's." might sound innovative, but that's not in my space, it's not something I do. So ideas have to be realistic and they have to use your common capability. And so what I always uh, try to do with people, and, and, and have, have been very successful at coming up with new ideas, is I said, look, it is about collaboration, don't do these things in isolation, get a bunch of people together and start having a conversation. But you have to facilitate those conversations to a point of moving to the sort of creative frontier of your mind. So, well, what we'll tend to do is we'll say, okay, what is what is your core competency? It sounds really obvious, it sounds really, really obvious, but when you start to actually look at your sort of internal canvas of what you do, you suddenly notice that you've got a lot more capability than you think you have, and you've got a lot more competence than you think you have. And when you start to frame that up, you start to come up with ideas. And then if you say, right, let's imagine the future. What are the burning platforms that are going on? But also, what are the trends that are happening? And these things are so easy to find nowadays. Because you just get on the internet. You get on the internet and people are talking. People are talking a lot. And you can very, very quickly and very, very easily find out what people um, want. And then you can start to fil filter those back in and collaborate with your teams so that you actually come up with some innovative uh, innovation opportunities. Um, I mean, effectively what I'm talking about is associative, associative brainstorming. Um, and you know, this is an example of something that I've used be before, where effectively what we did, what we did was we, we, we framed what the future looks like, and in 
framing, we don't, don't absolutely look at what, everything that's on there. Um, you know, we try to imagine what, what, what does 2020 look like? And if all of these things happen, what impact does that have on our business? And after analyzing what impact it has on our business, what, what different things could we do? What new things could we do? What new ideas can we come up with? And, and actually, this always seems to get people talking. And the first initial ideas don't always seem to be that great. But after uh, several conversations and several iterations, you get to a point where you've got something pretty good that you can start playing with. But now that you've got an idea, what do you do next? Well, one thing you can do, this is a, a new tool, um, effectively. Uh, this is the Business Model Canvas, which, um, which is something that I've used a few times. And, and you don't have to be the point is you've got to start asking yourself some really important questions. You know, who, who are your customers? How are you going to deliver your product? Um, and um, what is the customer pain that you're actually resolving here? Um, and then, the most important question, how are you going to make money out of it? You know, is there a commercial model there? Is there a price point? You know, do you use, is it just the price or do you do something slightly different? Um, and then you've got to start testing these things. And, that, and that's the most important thing. You know, this, this canvas allows you to kind of ask some questions, ask some important variables, and start to plot. And the way that this is tend, tends to be used, the way that I've used it before, is you literally just stick it up on the wall, you get a bunch of people, you give everyone a post-it note, and you start posting things up, and you start to say, okay, what does it actually look like? What, how could we actually deliver this idea? But you don't do it just once, you do it several times. You come up with several different business models. And then you take each of those post-it notes and you turn them into hypotheses. And after turning the hypotheses, the purpose of that is you then go and test them. Because actually, when you get out there and you test some of these things, you might suddenly find that actually it doesn't, doesn't really work. It's not working for me. Um, so we've got to do something different. And what I've, one of the reasons I put this up here is because one really interesting thing um, that I've experienced recently is I'm talking to a couple of venture capitalists who have heard of this tool and have been exposed to this tool, they turn around and told me that one of the biggest problems they have is lots of people come to them with these amazing business plans. You know, they're about 100 pages plus long, and five minutes after they've read the business plan, it's suddenly become obsolete. Um, whereas well, what they want is something that's going to give them a bit of confidence, something that's going to really make them understand the idea, and something that they know has been tested. And actually, this tool has actually provided that gap for them. So, and, and in some cases, the people who I know who have been very successful at using this tool, the people who have put it in a room and brought their venture capitalists along and said, right, I'm going to talk you through this. I'm going to get you involved in the process of shaping up some of these ideas. It doesn't always work, and I'm sure there are lots of venture capitalists out there who are not absolutely interested in this. But it is a new tool that I find really interesting. What's even more interesting about this tool is the way that it was created. I mean, th th this is, if you, if you interested in this tool, read a book called Business Model Generation. Um, the guy who wrote the book, effectively, he, what he described was he co-created it, so he actually used the internet to access lots and lots of people. I think he said something like 670 people. Um, and in accessing those people, he got lots of nice ideas. He just data mined them, he questioned them, he talked to them about you know, what, what is it that's a gap. He looked at lots of different industries. And then he, wrote his, he created this tool and wrote his book. And in his book, it clearly says there have been 607 contributors. Which, in my, in, you know, from my perspective, I think is, uh, is, is a fantastic innovation. In itself. Um, crowdsourcing um, is, is something quite interesting. I mean, I think there's several sort of themes on this on this slide. One thing is, you know, we're all servicing people, right? And those people have needs and wants. And even if you're in the B two B market, you know, your customers are potentially servicing consumers. So, the more we listen to those consumers, and the more we engage with those consumers. <coughs> the better we can be informed about what we do. And actually, that's quite easy nowadays because you've got the internet. And via the internet, you've got social media. Now, let me tell you a story about social media. Right? I, the first time I got uh, involved in using Twitter, right? um, I don't know what the heck it was about, if I'm honest with you. I thought, it must be a great tool because so many people are using it, but what's the big deal? Um, so I, I loaded up, set up a profile, I was quite proud of myself. I, getting on there and sending my first tweet, which I think was as simple as hello world. Um, and then I thought, okay, right, now what's going on? So I started following people, and all of a sudden, I had millions and millions of tweets, and I was just sitting there at my laptop watching. And I have to admit, really, really sad, I did this for two days solid, <coughs> watching, thinking, what the heck is this all about? Suddenly I learned how to use hashtags, 
Um, and you know, it's really easy to learn how to use this. There's, there's so much material on the internet. So if you've never used it before, like, just just get on the internet and start start.